Good morning, everybody. It's good to see all of you here today. I'm Andy. I've, we've not met. would love to get a chance to get to know you a little bit. As, as they've been saying, we're celebrating 15 years as a church today, and that's been a little bit emotional uh, for me just because this whole weekend has been about celebrating the church and what it's done. Um, but if you know our story, we, we, were, we moved here to Spring Hill in 03 to start the church, and so the 15-year anniversary for the church is the 15-year anniversary for us being here and all of those things as well. It's just been quite a, a journey. This Weekend, we had a picnic over at Hill, uh, Henry Horton Park, and they put together some slides. People would put, send them pictures of some of the older days or just along the way. And so we had this um, slideshow kind of going in the background all day. And I saw all these pictures, some of them from five years ago or 10 years ago, or some even from 12, 15 years ago. And I will say to you that some of you were in those pictures and you've aged a bit. I mean, I just, I just want to say, <laughs> if I can. And some of your kids were in those pictures, and your kids have aged a lot. Some of those little bitty kids in the pictures are now, you know, in college or whatever. I'm happy to report I've not changed a bit since 2003, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, and I look great all the way through, which has been, which has been great. I did have one moment uh, this weekend where at the picnic, and people would just kind of mill around, and some would come up in front of the, the screen and just kind of watch some pictures, and I'd go do something else. And I happened to walk up right as uh, some, some people there, some friends of mine were having a conversation, and I got up there, they didn't see me coming, so I walked up right beside them, right as the one was turning to the other saying, Andy used to have so much more hair. Like, right, right as I walked up, which was very kind for me just to walk into that, that was a great moment, and uh, so it's, it's been good, it's been good. I, I, I don't know if you, I told you this or not, I've told some of you, uh, one of the things I like to do sometimes with, when we're worshiping, when we're singing, I'll be over here singing or whatever, is I try to personalize things, so I kind of rewrite the songs in my head. To say, to say them as from me to God, like it's a prayer from me to God. So sometimes you, you change the his to, to yours, or you just kind of change some words around to, to make it work that way. And, and the song we just sang was so impactful to me, saying, God, you've, you've just never left us alone. It's like I was praying that, almost praying that prayer to God during the song. God, you've, just, you've always been through. And thinking about this weekend, it's just been a real cool, real cool deal. So thank you for you guys, some of you who've been part of it for you know, a few weeks, some of you have been part of it for a few years, and some of you for 14, 15 years. Thank you to, to you guys for all that you've done and what God's doing together. Today we're finishing up a series we've called The Journey, where we've talked about the journey that each of us are on, but really bigger the journey that, that we're on with God as a church. And to finish that, I want to turn, have you turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, page 851 in your Bible there in the seat. Uh, let me mark that. Feel free to grab one of those if you can make use of that. And I want to give, I, I, I do this on occasion. I, I'm all the time reading other people's stuff or listening to other people's messages or trying to get different ideas and put those together to help do better, give you better uh, material things here. Uh, Steve Gillen in particular this week, I, I got lots of good ideas from his things. So I want to make sure I mention that uh, just to be uh, on, on the up and up there. First Peter chapter 2 is what we're going to look at this morning. I want to start in verse 4, top left of the page, and we'll just kind of work through this passage together. 1 Peter 2, 4 says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. Now I want to stop a second. The living stone, he's talking about Jesus here, and he uses this analogy of a stone, a living stone, describing Jesus that, that is a cornerstone for our faith, a cornerstone for life. And I want you to notice the descriptors there. He said he was chosen by God. He was precious to God, even when he was rejected by people. And if you know the historical uh, angle of Jesus, Jesus was brought in. At the end of his life, he was, he was put up to be crucified, rejected by the mobs of people. And yet all the way through that, God loved him, God chose him, God believed in him, God valued him, and, uh, even as he's been rejected by mobs of people around him. That, that builds into verse 5. Verse 5 says, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It says, You like living stones. Did you notice the not-so-subtle parallel there? So Jesus is the living stone, capital S. You and I are living stones, lowercase s. We're a, a mini-me version of Jesus. Like we're a, a smaller version of Jesus in the world. He is the living stone. We are a bunch of living stones along the way that builds this together. We're to be looking like Jesus and acting like Jesus. And just like Jesus, we are chosen by God. And just like Jesus, we are precious to God. Even when we feel rejected by people. That's a theme he's going to go through again and again here. We'll see that. 
But I want to stop because for some of us, that's, that's a nice idea, a nice metaphor. For some of you today, that's huge because you're feeling rejected by people right now. You're going through it right now. And if that's you, I want you to know that you've been chosen by God and you're precious to God. He sees you. Even if you feel like the world's rejecting you, God doesn't reject you. He chose you. Now look, look at verse 4 and 5 again because there's a lot in here. I'm not sure we get it all. As you come to him, the living stone, Jesus, rejected by humans, chosen by God, precious to God, we also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We are living stones being built into a spiritual house. Some translations, you'll notice at the bottom of your page there, some translations say we're being built into a temple for his spirit. It's a huge picture. But this is a different picture of church than what many of us have. And so if this is you coming in, I want to make sure you get the right picture of church because we, we get it mixed up in America. You and I are part of the church. We are the church. The church is not a building or a program. It's us. That means when you consider church whether it's Wellspring you're thinking about or another church that you might attend or whether it's the church at large, that's not them, that's us. We're the church. So if you dig on the church, if you, if you put in little shots at the church, you're putting in shots about us, it's us. It's not us and them, it's us and us. We're part of that. You need to shift your pronouns. Let me use some examples. It wouldn't be right for you to say in a positive way, I love the way that our church, or you know, that church gives jetpacks to hungry kids. That's factually accurate, but not the right way for you to say it. It's the wrong pronoun. You should say, we're not okay with kids going to bed hungry within reach of our church. We're going to fix that. Do you notice the sh- shift there? It's, it's not they, it's we. It's you're the church. Or like you're not saying on a more negative sense, you're not saying they need to get more people to direct parking after second service, you know, like hypothetically. You're not saying that. You're saying, we have a parking problem. As a church, we've got to fix that. You know, hypothetically. I mean, again, hypothetically, uh, here. It's a a small difference, but it's the idea between it's it's them to it's us. The Bible sees the church not as a them, but as an us. It's you. It's me. It's the difference between a small piece of tile and a mosaic. It's very different. You know, mosaic is made of thousands of tiles. They each have a, a very insignificant role, but together... They do these amazing things. It's the difference between a small piece of colored glass and a stained glass window. Now, this particular analogy, this particular picture, that's a preacher's dream right there. So not only do you have a collection of lots of little pieces of glass together, they do this big thing together, that's great, but you have the sun shining through it, and that could be a church sign. I mean, there's all kinds of things you could do with that. I could spend some more time there, but I don't don't have time for that. I, I brought a brick up on stage as well. Now, this brick by itself can do some stuff. You can prop your door open with it. On a windy day, you could put it on your desk and you know, keep the papers in line or whatever, but it, it doesn't really have a lot of value to it. But together, you can build a building. Together, you can keep the storm out. Together, you can keep intruders out. Together, you can do amazing things when a bunch of bricks get together. On its own, it doesn't do much, but together. So when, question, when you see this picture, what do you notice first? Now, do I have to preach through this? i got a lot to cover today. Can I just skip past... I mean, I could, I could unpack this for you, but I think you see the point here, right? What you notice is this one picture, this one brick that's got some stuff out of the way. And the, and the Bible here says that you and I are the church. We're living stones, the kind that can get wiggly and walk off and do something else, the kind that can get distracted, the kind that can get discontented or busy. But we're living stones. And when we walk away, when we don't do our part, what we notice is the whole. That's what's left. First Corinthians 12 points to this. It says, all of you, all of us, together are Christ's body, and each of us is a part of it. You've got a place. You've got a spot. The role of the church has never been to get a crowd of unconnected people to come together and listen to a few people on stage do something. It's always been us together, each taking our part, each changing the world. You and I, Peter says, are being built into a spiritual house. We're all living stones that God's putting together. I love the, uh, some other translations of verse 5 there. The New Living Translation says, You are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. God is building a spiritual temple in Spring Hill, and you're part of that. And that's a pretty cool picture to me. That God is shaping our lives and crafting us and redirecting us and encouraging us so that we can take our place as part of this larger vision that he has for our city and our community. 
I think it's not insignificant that Peter writes this way. Peter writes about living stones and being built into a spiritual house. Do you remember his story? Peter's story really, I think, shapes this. He had an encounter with Jesus that, that, that Matthew writes down in Matthew 16, where, where Jesus comes to the, his disciples, Peter and the others, and says, who do people, when they're talking about me, what do they say? Who do they say that I am? And Matthew 16, 14 says, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And I don't, I don't know, we don't, we don't know exactly how this works, but I kind of picture maybe, maybe different ones are saying that. I mean, it's not like one person, but they replied. So one said John the Baptist. Maybe somebody else said, hey, I heard somebody say Elijah. Somebody else said, well, I heard Jeremiah. And they kind of just pitch it in there together. And then Jesus says, yeah, but what about you? And again, Scripture doesn't elaborate as much as I would like it to sometimes, but in my head, when I'm hearing this, I think there's a long, awkward pause. Scripture doesn't tell us that, so maybe that's not true, but I picture a long, awkward pause. Because in verse 14, when he says, who did they say I am? It says, they answered. They all jumped in and gave answers. But it says, yeah, but what about you? Who do you say? It's more personal. Who do you say that I am? It says that Peter replied. So the rest of them didn't jump in. So I'm picturing Jesus saying that, and they're all kind of crickets looking around like, I don't know to say that. I'm not sure what to say. And in verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And that was a huge statement of faith. Jesus reacts to that in verse 18. He says, I tell you that you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So Jesus says, I'm going to build my church, and I'm going to do it on this declaration of faith. The gospel is going to go and change the world. But in the English, you miss some of it. So I need to unpack it just a second from the original language, the Greek language, because they would have picked up on some things that we don't naturally pick up on. Now, there's a lot of debate over this, so people disagree. But let me just give you some things that we know. Jesus gives him the name Peter. Now, prior to that, he had been called Simon or he'd been called Cephas. But here, Jesus says he's Peter. And the Greek word for that is the Greek word Petros. Petros specifically means a pebble. And even more specifically than just a pebble, it means a detached pebble. Like one little pebble out by itself. Not like a pebble like in a pea gravel in your playground, but like a pebble. One little pebble detached by itself. So he says, you're Peter, you're this small little detached pebble, and on this rock I'm going to build my church. But he doesn't use the same word for rock, it's a different word. That second word, rock, the one upon which he's going to build the church is the Greek word Petra. So definitely connected, Petros and Petra, but that rock means a massive connected rock, like a ledge or a cliff or a boulder. So he says, you're this little detached pebble off by itself, But on this huge, boulder, monstrosity of connected rock, I'm going to build my church. Peter's only significant because he believed in the truth of the gospel. Peter's only significant because he allowed God to access his life. He was just one guy. He was just one disconnected little pebble. But God used him and his declaration of faith and all those who would follow him yielded to God to build his church. So Peter gets it. He understands that. It was foundational for his faith. So then back in 1 Peter chapter 2, he writes this way. The message translation says, Present yourselves as building stones for the construction of a sanctuary, vibrant with life, in which you'll serve as holy priests, offering Christ-approved lives up to God. Now, just to make sure we're clear, he, he would have said, Matthew 16 happened early, and when Jesus was still in, here on earth, years passed by, and he writes that. Years of him ministering to the community. Years of him preaching the gospel to those around the world and seeing God do amazing things with this little bitty disconnected pebble. He says, and I want you to join me. Put your life in the ring. Be part of this. Be all in, and God's going to use you to offer up Christ-approved lives to God. Let's look at verse 4 and 5 again. I think there's a little more in there we want to grab. As you come to him, the living stone, Jesus, rejected by humans, Chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You know, now that you realize you've been chosen by God, Peter says, now that you realize you're precious to God, and now that we know that he's building us into a spiritual house to be a dwelling place for his spirit and for worship, he says, now we're to be priests. Offering up our lives as a sacrifice to God. You know, I don't know what you do for a living, each of you. Some of you are teachers, some of you are 
business world, accountants, some of you are plumbers or carpenters or farmers or whatever your role might be, but that's just the front. Like when you work for the CIA, you know, everybody has like their front job that everybody sees, but then behind the scenes they're actually doing these weird, crazy things. Like your front job may be a, a plumber or a teacher or a farmer or a factory worker or whatever. It may be all of those things, and that's great. But your real job, your undercover true job, is that you're a priest in this world for God. And he's using you, your one little disconnected pebble life, to build this mass of a rock, the church. A new priestly order. And he invites us, but more than invites us, he's compelling us to be a part of that new priestly order. Edwin Blum writes it this way, every Christian, every Christian is a part of a new priestly order. It means that every Christian has immediate access to God, that he serves God personally, that he ministers to others, and that he has something to give. And that's true of you whether you believe it or not. I mean, all four of those things are true of you. If you're a follower of Christ, all four of those things are true of you. You have immediate access to God. You don't need to go through me or a priest or a pastor or anybody else. You can talk to God through Christ. You serve God personally. You're not some you know, guy way down the food chain that the, the, the CEO doesn't know. You serve God personally. And you minister to other people on behalf of God as a priest in the world. And you have something to give, something to offer. It's true of you whether you believe it or not. God's vision has always been that he would impact the entire world through us, his church. His, his vision never stopped at just the Israelites. His vision never stopped at just our church or just uh, the community that's with him. His vision has always been larger to reach the entire planet through us as we embrace our calling. So now Peter speaks to that. We read verse 4 and 5. Skip on down to verse 9 because he, he puts a crescendo on this together and describes in very clear terms who we are. Verse 9 says, But you are a chosen people. Not you might be, not you can aspire to be, not you might one day live up to. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. He mentions four things that you and I are. Now, you are, because of Christ, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Let me take just a second on each of those to make sure we're on the same page. First, he says you're a chosen people. God, the living God, the king of the universe who created everything you see, God chose you. Your faith is not an accident. You didn't just happen into a church. You didn't just happen along spiritually. God picked you. He chose you. God reached out of heaven and picked you. I mean, it's huge to me. God is on a personalized mission for each of us. It's not like he just has this random plan for the world and you fit into it somehow as you find your way and find your place. God's personalized ideas for you. He has plans for you and dreams for you. He chose you. You know, sometimes when life gets hard, it's easy to think that he forgot us. Sometimes when life gets hard, it's easy to think that he's missed us or he just didn't see us or somehow we didn't matter to him. But he didn't forget you. He didn't reject you. He chose you. Scripture says we're a chosen people to be a royal priesthood. We're a chosen people to be a royal priesthood. You're a priest. Priests were, were selected out of the rest of God's people to serve God's people. That was their role, to serve. So you and I are to be servants. We're to find ways to use what God has given us to serve. Now, let me just give you one word of advice here. When life gets hard, it's really easy to turn inward. Went through a hard time, you've got some extra struggles, things are going difficult. It's easy to say, let me just take care of my own here. Let me just take care of myself. And there's times to heal and all that sort of thing. Get outside advice on that. But when you're feeling a little discouraged, a little down, a little put on, and you're just feeling that temptation to turn your sights inward, that's really bad advice. When you do that, it makes you a victim. You're not a victim. You're a servant. And when you choose, as weird as this sounds, when you choose to stop looking inward and to turn your eyes outward, and, and even in those difficult times, find ways to serve someone else, it takes your mindset from being a victim to being a servant. It's different. You're a priest. And not just any priest. He says you're a royal priesthood. Joseph Thayer writes, the priests of kingly rank were exalted to a moral rank and freedom which exempts them from the control of everyone but God and Christ. You are exempted from the control of everyone in this world but God and Christ. 
unless you're my daughter living in my house, and then you're still under my control. But outside of that, for the rest of you, you're exempt from control of others. You've been elevated to a, a priestly rank, and now you're exempt from the control of everybody else except for God, except for Jesus Christ. It's the same kind of freedom, the exact same kind of freedom that, that Paul writes about in Galatians 2, where he says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You have died to yourself, and no one else has a hold on you. You don't need to look to social media for advice. You don't need to look to the Smiths or Joneses to see how to keep up and live. You are free from all of that nonsense. You only report to one. You're only designed to please one. And that makes you not a victim. It makes you a servant. Since you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, we're also a holy nation. God has always been on the lookout to find a group of people, a people group, a nation, a, a, a gathering, a, a community, that said, you know what, we're going to do things God's way. There's lots of people groups, nations around the world, and some do things this way, and some do things this way, and some do things this way. But God's always been on the lookout to find a group of people who says, you know what, I'm going to look here to God's words, and I'm going to do it His way. Whatever His way is, I'm going to do it. So the other nations may do it that way, that's fine. I'm going to do it God's way. We're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Holy means set apart. You and I are to be literally set apart for God. By God and for God. And we're going to say, you know what? We're going to look to this book and God's words and we're going to do things His way. Now, I want to ask you a grammar question. Some of you are not grammar people. You can tune out. I'll bring you back in a second. But for the grammar people among us, what do you notice about those three nouns grammatically? They're all plural. He says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, those are all plural nouns. God is not calling me or calling you as much as he's calling us to be his people. He's not looking for a brick. He's looking for a wall, living stones to build a spiritual house. And together, together we can be a temple for God, a place where inside of this community things are done God's way and God's spirit has dominion inside of this group and God's people then reach out from here to serve the world. Now, of the four, my, the fourth one is my favorite. You're not supposed to have favorites in the Bible or as parents. I get that. But the fourth one is my favorite. You're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. But the fourth phrase is one that grabs me. It's, you are God's special possession. This is the challenge for the week. If you've been following us on this series, the first week I challenged you to be a believer, to accept what God has said to be true. Last week I challenged you to be a follower, to take those words, those beliefs, and to apply them into your life, and to follow Jesus, to literally change what you're doing, to follow Him. But today I want to be, ask you to begin to see yourself, as you truly are, a special possession of God. Now question, which of those two parts is the hardest for you to, to accept? That you're special, that you're cherished, that you're adored by God, that He notices you and that you stand out, or that you're His possession. That he, he is over you. The, the Bible word is He's our Lord, He's our King. Our modern ears don't hear that very well. Which, which of those is harder for you? You know, as a follower of Christ, and I, I know everyone's not there yet, but if you're a follower of Christ, you are special to Him. You're cherished, you're adored. And if you've given your life to Christ, then you are his possession. So, so both of those, whether you believe them or not, they're both true. In fact, I want to, think, I want to invite you to kind of take a journey and think about your journey. And wherever you are in this journey, I want to challenge you to take a step. So for some of you, you you've not yet believed. You're not sure you believe all of this. You're not sure you believe the, the words of God. You're not sure you believe that Jesus was real. He may have just been a guy. You're, you're wrestling with that. And if that's you, I'm glad you're here. But I want you to investigate that. And over time... When you're ready, I want to challenge you to take a step and say, you know what, I believe that. I believe that to be true. And for me, there was a point when I did that, and it's kind of like, okay, so is that it? I've, like, I've, I've done what I need to do now? There's more. You need to move beyond that and say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take those beliefs now and be a follower. And some of you are there, and if you're not there, I want to challenge you. But, but if you are there, it's like, is that it? I'm following God now. No, there's, there's another step. I want to ask that you see yourself as a cherished possession a special possession of the Most High God. You know, some of you struggle with dark thoughts. It's getting on epidemic proportions in America, and Spring Hill is 
not only not an exception, it may be a highlight uh, among, our, uh, among our nation, among our culture. Lots of us struggle with dark thoughts, anxiety, worry, fear. And I, I'm confident that this room has some that I know struggle and some that I don't know that struggle. And it's probably quite, a, probably might be surprised a lot of us. Voices in your head that condemn you. Messages about who you are and maybe more often messages about who you're not. And can I just encourage you as, as your pastor based on this passage to just declare those voices are not true? You, you are not those things. You are a cherished son of the Most High God. You are a cherished daughter of the Most High God. And he sees you and he chose you and you are special to him. You matter. If God is for us, who can be against us, Scripture says. You're cherished. You're special to him. But, but the next word is, it takes it a little different angle. It's a word that's unfamiliar to us a bit. It, it says that we are a, a special possession, a cherished possession. That's a word we don't think of with modern ears. You know, sometimes as a pastor, I'll perform weddings for people. So I'll stand in a room like this, and, and a, a bride will walk down an aisle, and a groom will step out and meet her, and they will hold hands, and they will look into each other's eyes, and they'll make commitments each to the other. And at some point along the, along the line, usually they say something along the lines of, with all that I am and all that I have, I commit myself to you. And then the other one will turn to the other and they'll hold hand. With all that I am, all that I have, I commit myself to you. When I, when I hear Peter's words here about your special possession, I hear the, the idea of us saying, I'm not just a believer, I'm not just a follower. I understand that God, all that I am and all that I have, it's all yours. I'm your special possession. I remember 15 years ago, I told you I've been reminiscing a lot these days. I remember 15 years ago, right before we launched the church, some of you may have heard some of these stories, some of you may not have. We, we spent six months or so getting ready, probably the hardest six months of my life work-wise. I mean, just long hours and lots to do, and I didn't know how to do a lot of the things I was doing. And so we moved here the end of February uh, and so we went through August just getting ready, getting ready, and getting ready. And, and the different people that we accumulated as part of our launch team, um, they went to, a lot of them went to a church in Franklin, some went to other churches, and so they all did their church thing on Sunday mornings. But we'd meet during the week, we'd plan, and we'd strategize. And we're saying in October, we're going to plant this church. So we'd spent six months praying. And then in September, we said we need to start meeting together as a group on, on Sundays. But we did something I thought was kind of cool. Uh, and we said, we're not going to meet on Sunday mornings. We'll meet on Sunday nights as a group, and we'll have a worship service together. But on Sunday mornings, we're going to meet together for September, those four weeks in September, and we're going to walk the neighborhoods, and we're going to just go and pray for people. And we were very specific with all of our group. We were all very excited, so we tried to kind of keep everybody tamped down. Don't knock on anybody's door. We thought the last, if you're sleeping on a Sunday morning, the last thing you want is a bunch of happy people, you know, knocking on your door. <laughs> it's not the tone we were trying to set in the community at all. So we don't, no, didn't do any of that. We just walked the neighborhood. We prayed for people. We prayed for houses. If anybody was out and we saw them out, we'd try to kind of catch eyes with them, maybe mowing their yard or walking their dog, and we'd just say hi, tell them what we're doing, tell them we're here for the community, tell them we're starting this church, invite them to that Sunday. And then as they walked away, man, we prayed for them extra special because we figured if they're out in their yard at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, they're not tied to a church. We weren't trying to get people to churches. We're trying to help people who aren't part of the church. And so we just did that every Sunday morning, four Sundays in a row. And then on Sunday nights, we'd come back together and we'd have a worship service in our little offices. Now down from Papa John's there in the strip mall, still there. And uh, we would do a little worship time and communion and such. And then I didn't have time to write sermons. I was, we were busy. I didn't have time for that. So I, I, I kind of cashed in some of my chips with my friends, called in favors. And I had four different guys come in who were pastors of other churches come in and preach for us on Sunday night just to inspire our little team, you know. And it was a, it was a cool deal. But sometimes, sometimes that, that group on Sunday night was so small, it was almost embarrassing. I'm having my friends come in to speak, and we're going to start this church, and there's just a smattering of people. I remember one Sunday in particular, I had my friend Greg from the south side of Atlanta come to preach. He, he lives in Peachtree City, Georgia. Some of you are familiar with that suburb. And, and so he was there, and he, would, he was uh, preaching. So he preached three times at his, his church, big church in Atlanta, on Sunday morning. And then he had a, a, a leader, a friend of his, a, he was an executive at Chick-fil-A, so Chick-fil-A and Wellspring have been tied to the hip from you know, day one. So he was, he was there, and he, would, he drove his, his friend, Greg, my friend, drove him from Peachtree City to Spring Hill 
And he got here right before the service started to preach because he thought he, he's got to have some rest sometime during the day. So he preached three times in this big church, drove four and a half hours, got there right before the service started to preach to our group. I told him, we have 50 people on our launch team. That had been our goal, to get to 50. And so we were adding people, adding people, adding people, and we were 49 and stuck for quite a while. And then I realized one day that Jennifer McClellan was pregnant with Creed, and we are just counting her once. That's two lives there. That's 50. Ding, check that off. I had 50, right? And so Creed still gets tired of these stories, I think. But it's all right. He's 15. He's still around here somewhere. He was, he was number 50 for us. So I told our, my friend Greg, hey, we got 50 people. Come preach us. So he preached three times Sunday morning, hopped in the car. The guy drove him up to here. Got here right before service started. I think he drove crazy. He broke speed limits to get here. Got out, began to, began to preach. And I think that night we had 18 people. And I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed. Preached to hundreds of people that morning, drove nine hours round trip to speak to 18 people. Four of the 18 were named Huddleston. <laughs> so I'm not sure they count. Two of, the, two of the 18 I had had come from Atlanta. I mean, they were two of the 18, right? So, and I remember that night going home and praying to God and just feeling like a failure. I just spent six months, the hardest months of my life, trying to start a church, and we had 18 people, four of whom were named Huddleston, two I imported from Atlanta. And I said, God, I'm not sure this is going to work. I may not be the right guy. And I had this moment with God, you know. And I'm sure I'm clearer now, hindsight, than I was then. But looking back, I feel like I had this moment where I just, God just kind of reassured me. And he said, it's not about all that. This is not your church. I I didn't say you'll build my church. I said, I'll build my church. And I'm going to do that. And he said, just, just, Put yourself out there. Be yielded to me. And, and I remember kind of having this moment where I just said, you know, God, whatever it turns out to be, all that I have, all that I have, it's just yours. Fast forward nine years, we began to talk about building this facility. Now, there were many reasons not to do it. We didn't have any money, like we didn't have any money. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a lot of hassle. We were worried it would change us. I mean, like we had, uh, when we announced we were building the church, we had more people concerned than excited, which says something about the character of our church. Because there's like, we like how the church is. We don't want to be a different kind of church. Like, we like, we're weird and we like that. We don't want to mess this thing up. And we knew financially, if things didn't go a certain way, we could, we could shut the whole thing down. Like, this might not work. And many nights I would walk this neighborhood crying out to God God, I need wisdom. I'm not sure I'm the right guy for this. God, give us some good favor at City Hall. God, give us some money. Like, initially, when I was writing this down, I wrote down provision. Because that sounds really spiritual. You know, that's what Pastor says. I wasn't asking for provision. I just got I need some cash. I need some money. I need some money. We're out of money, you know? And time and again, I came back to this same spot. Just, you're just a, you're my son. You're a cherished child of God. God, whatever it is, all that I am, all that I have, it's just yours. Fast forward to today. You know, some of you have been part of different parts of the, of the church. We, we've been saying these days... You know, chapter one was in the school, 10 years. Chapter two is in this building, five years here. And now we're on the edge of jumping into chapter three, which will expand this building, move into Columbia with the campus. And if I have a concern, if I have a concern, it's that I totally think we can handle this. We got this. It's fiscally responsible. It's manageable. It's going to be hard, sure, but we got this. We can do this. And we have never as a church jumped into a venture like this when we weren't over our heads. We have never jumped into a venture like this where we weren't pleading with God, please God, bail us out, we can't do this alone. And if I have a concern, it's that we could handle this without a lot of help from him. I'm a little concerned we might think that. So I need you to pray with me. I need you to pray for me. I need you to stand before God at night. I need you to walk the neighborhood or to get down on your knees, however you do it, and to put your hands out before God and say, God, all that I am, all that I have, it's yours. And you do with it as you will. And I think God's going to honor that prayer. When we come together as a church and we put our hands out before God and we, we cry out to him and say, God's yours. Do with it as you will. He will take all of these little disconnected pebbles, insignificant on their own, and he'll throw the gospel on top of it and he'll build this huge mountain of a boulder together. He'll do that. And together, he's going to use us to change hundreds of lives. Hundreds of lives. One of these days, I believe we're going to look back at this moment, this season we're in. We'll be in our rocking chairs 
in the old folks' home. And we'll be swapping stories and telling, telling tales. And I really think when we look back at this moment, we're going to be glad that in this season it clicked with us, maybe for the first time, that we're a cherished son of the Most High God, cherished daughter of the Most High God. And we began to not pay attention to some of the stuff we were paying attention to. We began to tell some of those voices to shut up. And we began to see things differently because we realized that God saw us as his and we were special. And I think we'll look back from the rocking chair at this moment and be so glad that we finally realize that, that we're his. He's in charge. That we said to God with open hands, all that we have, all that we are, it's yours. Would you bow your heads and let's pray together. God, if I could pray for two things, man, I'd be so thrilled to pray for those two. That every one of us in this room would tell those condemning voices to shut up and we would hear truth from your scripture that says we are yours, chosen by you, special to you. And we wouldn't worry, we wouldn't be anxious, we wouldn't be afraid because we're yours. You're holding us up, we're not holding ourselves. And second, God, I would pray that all of us, with all of our distractions and all of their compelling interests and divided loyalties, we would all realize that our lives are yours. We're your special possession. You're our Lord. You own us. You're in charge of our life. All that we have, all that we are, God, it's yours. As a church, we yield to you. As individual lives, little disconnected pebbles, we yield to you. All that we have and all that we are. Would you take a moment and pray to God, especially about whichever of those is harder for you to hear? You're not in charge, and you are special. Would you yield one of those or both of those to God just now? Pray to him in your own words, and I'll pray for us to close.